You're listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy. Learn about how gratitude turns what you have into enough through stories of motivation and inspiration. Wherever you are in your life and whatever you're going through, That Gratitude Guy is here to help you achieve great things and live a happier, healthier life. Change the way you live today right here with David George Brooke. That Gratitude Guy, starting now. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast. I am David George Brooke, your host, where my mission is to have guests that relate and recall moments of their lives that were propelled and energized by utilizing the power of a gratitude mindset. You can expect a deeper dive into gratitude's immense power, a gratitude tip of the show, maybe a gratitude nugget, how you can become a gratitude believer, and maybe one or two or maybe three takeaways from my guest today. My podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, or anywhere else that you get your podcast. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. I always appreciate that. A lot of people ask me about the Gratitude Journal, that in order to get a Gratitude Journal or to find out more about my Gratitude speaking or coaching, one-on-one or group coaching, you can find me at thatgratitudeguy.com. So let me get on with the show. Always the most important part to me is to introduce my guest. I'm excited to have this young man. He's a heck of a lot younger than me, so I'll call him a young man on my show. Patrick Snow is an international best-selling author, professional keynote speaker, publishing, speaking, and book and marketing coach. A lot of coaching there. He first discovered his gift for speaking at the age of 17 while giving the pregame speeches in his high school football team. Since then, Patrick has electrified more than 3,500 audiences on four continents to achieve their individual and and organizational destinies. Patrick's destiny message has been widely recognized in the media, including the New York Times and Forbes magazine. His book, story, and family photo were also featured on the cover story in a 2002 issue of USA Today. Originally from Michigan, Patrick graduated from the University of Montana in 1991. He lived in the Seattle area for more than 20 years until 2013 when he achieved his lifelong dream and moved to the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. So if you just welcome to That Gratitude Guy podcast, the Dean of Destiny, as he's known to many people, Patrick. So Patrick, welcome to the podcast. Well, David, thank you so much for having me on your show. And thank you for that spectacular speaker introduction that that could very well be the best introduction that I've ever written. So thank you. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And I always start out the same way for a context. Tell people to your best recollection, recollection, how you and I met. Wow. Uh, networking event somewhere um, in Seattle, like maybe 10, 12, 15 years ago. And I don't know more than that. I think we were connected by somebody virtually, but we didn't actually meet in person for a lot of years until later I was in uh, doing a publishing event in Redmond, Washington. I think that's the first time we actually met in person. Very so maybe good. you help me, help me with that answer. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a pretty good recollection. And because I do remember being in an event on 45th in the U district where I met you anywhere in the bottom part of a restaurant and you were doing a publishing sort of a, a a webinar, if you will. And I remember in that's in, it was kind of, man, I love this guy. He's doing books and all that kind of thing. And then we did kind of keep in contact throughout uh, the years. And then more recently, that was a couple of years ago in Redmond. And that was that uh, woman's group. And I applaud you for keeping in touch with me because I will get a hardcover book done and it will be with you. So, but getting back, so let's talk a little bit about books because that is such a huge part of it. And, and it's one of the themes that I have, as you can imagine through this is all about gratitude and what you're grateful for and how it's changed. And you've had, I know your life story pretty well, but you've had some major ups and downs. So how is maybe gratitude or your appreciation for things played a role for you in keeping you moving forward when you've had some of those significant ups and downs throughout life? Well, I think um, one of the biggest blows that I've had was losing my father eight years ago. Mm. And um, he died 74 years old of pancreatic cancer after a courageous battle and a courageous fight with that. And I remember at the time thinking how sad that was and how sad I was that he passed at such a young age, um, you know, 74, because I wanted him to live to be 84 or 94. And uh, I remember thinking, that, wait a minute, my best friend from third grade, he lost his mother at 12 years old. Mm. So how selfish am I to focus on, you know, having my dad with me for the first 47 years of my life. And yet my best friend, you know, lost his mother at 12. 
and missed out on 30 some odd years of, of that time together. So once I was able to kind of readjust my thinking around that, I realized that, you know what, I need to be grateful, not that, don't be sad that he's gone, be grateful that he lived and be grateful that we had 47 years together and be grateful that, uh, that I learned so much from him, that he was my best friend, my rock, my mentor, my foundation, that he was my biggest fan. And uh, that was like, wow, there's a lot of people out there that their dads are alive today, but yet they haven't talked in 20 years. Yeah. And he was like, yeah. So I think that really helped me, you know, get through that tough time. And I think it's a really good point because somebody gave me this analogy that I really liked is that if you're running a marathon, I ran one and only one marathon, 1981. Should you be proud of yourself at 13 miles because you're halfway there? Or should you be focusing on the fact I've still got 13 miles to go? And the answer is both. You know, yeah. and really, because the young man that lost his his father in the second grade, but then again, your dad passed much earlier than he should have. And yet there's people that you and I know that have their parents into the 90s. And I'm so jealous of that, too. So it's always the relative thing. But I think so much of what I talk about with gratitude is gratitude turns what you have into enough. And so it's always about making sure that you see, I guess, the glass half full. We hear that a lot. But I just think it's so important to function to focus on your blessings and your abundance and not worrying about your lack or, or things that you don't have. And, and so many people do that. They compare themselves to other people and so forth. So, but getting, I, I want to spend a little time talking about the whole book aspect of what you've done, because it's always been something that's impressed the heck out of me. Uh, tell the listeners a little bit about how you got into the book business and the book publishing and how that kind of worked in your life. Well, it's a great question. Um, I've been an athlete my entire life, but in high school, I was in football, basketball, and tennis, and baseball before that, and I played sports my entire life, so I was always into personal growth and development, and some of the greatest things that I learned was from my football coaches and basketball coaches about discipline and teamwork, and, and one of my coaches introduced me to Vince Lombardi, and once I learned about Vince Lombardi, then I started reading all of his quotes on excellence, and I still started realizing, wait a minute, this is not just about playing high school sports, it's about having a foundation to go after your dreams and goals and visions. And I've always thought that people that were athletes that had mentors and coaches like I've had, I, I've always felt we've had an unfair advantage in life and business over maybe some of the others that didn't learn about teamwork and dedication and discipline and sacrifice in our early years. And so uh, my goal is to play pro football. That, that was my goal, but I had a career ending back injury playing college football. And at that point, I transformed my athletic discipline into my academics, into my career, and specifically into personal growth and development. And I started speaking uh, more and more to high school groups and youth groups and churches and schools and Boy Scouts and FBLA and DECA. And I think between 22 and 26, I gave 300 speaking engagements, and I failed 300 times to get paid. But being a strong man of faith, I had to come to Jesus talk, and it's like, what am I doing wrong here? Why can't I make it in this business? And the answer I got back from the universe completely changed my life because I heard these words back. If you want what others have, you must do what others have done and you'll get what others have gotten. And in that moment, I realized the reason why I couldn't get paid as a professional speaker is because people viewed me as an amateur, as a hobbyist, as a wannabe one day. And who's going to pay those 26-year-old kid, you know, big money to go speak on stage to a bunch of 60-year-olds? And so I sat down and hunkered down and I spent five years and $20,000 writing and publishing my first book, Creating Your Own Destiny. I made so many mistakes. I did so many things wrong. And thankfully, over the years, I re-released the book in a second edition, a third edition, a fourth edition. I eventually published The Affluent Entrepreneur and then Boy Entrepreneur. But as soon as my first book came off the press, people started asking me, well, Patrick, who's your editor and proofreader and typesetter and did you print in China, Canada, US? How'd you get your book translated into Arabic and Russian and Spanish and Indonesian? How'd you sell the English language rights in India and Africa? How, how, how? And at the time, my boys were like seven and four years old, and now they're like 20, no, 30 and 26. And uh, I realized that, wait a minute, there's a whole industry that I've uncovered that almost nobody's doing. And that is the industry of publishing coaching, writing coaching, book marketing coaching professional speaker coaching and coach coaching. And so naturally having a desire to be home more with my kids and raise them and coach them in football and basketball and lacrosse, uh, serving as a writing, publishing, book marketing coach and speaker coach gave me that luxury to be a professional keynote speaker like 20% of the time and then a, a coach 80% of the time. And that allowed me to stay home most of my kids' youth. 
And then 10 years ago when they graduated, then I was able to get out and speak even more. So the coaching industry and the publishing industry has been great. And I think today we published about 1300 clients all over the world, you know, fiction, nonfiction, children's books, spirituality, romance novels, sci-fi, but most of my clients are personal growth and development, self-help, you know, leadership, sales, entrepreneurship type books. So that's kind of how it all evolved over the years. I mean, I never grew up ever in my life thinking I want to be a publishing coach. That just wasn't a goal, but it fell into my lap as the lifestyle to allow me to live anywhere I want and have complete time and money freedom. And so for that reason, it's been a good thing. You know, it, it's a great point. And I think I've heard you say this before about uh, the 300 speaking engagements and you use the word, I failed 300 times to get paid. But on the other hand, I think back on when I started with doing so many talks free for rotaries and chambers of commerce and lions and Qantas and all that kind of thing. But think about what those 300 did to help you hone the message. I mean, it may yeah. be like you said, well, they're not going to pay a 26 year old at this kind of fee and he's going to do that. And that's very true. But I think it's it's like I somebody once told me that knew I wanted to be a speaker. They said there's this great speaking day. They told me his name in L.A. And you went down there from Friday afternoon till Sunday evening and it was five grand or something like that. And on Sunday evening, you're a great speaker. You know, and, and I just don't believe it. And you mentioned playing football and you wanted to professionally and any of those things where it's just time in the saddle and it's in the weight room and it's in the, in the chalkboard or all those different things. And I just can't imagine that that 300 experiences didn't help you to just really fine tune your message. Well, Dottie Walters in her book, Speak and Grow Rich, she is on record in her book stating that you need to give 300 speeches mm. in your apprenticeship as a speaker and have that 300 speeches as stage time. Because yep. during that time, that's where you get able to hone your audience and your skill set to make your audience laugh and cry. You get to challenge them, to change them, to inspire them, to tell jokes, to bomb on stage and have your jokes not work. And then have your jokes really work and then learn how to get a stand innovation and learn how to get referrals and learn the business model of the, the business behind the speaking industry. Because as a professional speaker, the easiest part of the industry is on stage speaking. Mm -hmm. The challenging part is the marketing, booking engagements, and all of that. Yeah. So I, I forgot to mention this in my previous call, but as soon as I got published like 22, 21 years ago, then immediately I started getting paid all the time. Mm -hmm. And today my keynote speaking fee is 25 grand. I've never been paid 25 grand, but I've been paid 20, 18, 19, 17. In my, you know, I get a lot in the 5, 10, 15 grand. It all depends on their budget. Mm -hmm. But it was because of the book. Without the book, I couldn't get booked. Yeah. And so um, the industry has been amazing. And the thing that I love more than anybody else, and you know what it's like having that speaker's high, but I also get that coaching high when you've been working with somebody for three or six or nine months and their book shows up on their doorstep and they got 500 copies delivered by FedEx or UPS. And they're jumping for joy, doing cartwheels, having videos and taking pictures. And like, Patrick, you know what? After the birth of my children and my marriage to my spouse, writing my book is the third biggest thing that I've ever achieved in my life. And, and thank you so much for that. And it's just hard to describe how good that makes you feel in terms of like a soul level mission and goal to make a contribution to humanity in that way. So I love it. And I hope that people remember how important that is because I was mentioning somebody the other day, one of my favorite size audiences, there's several thousand, which is really nice, but it's, it's pretty big. And then there's 50 or 80 or something that's small, but at 500 to a thousand range, 500, 800 is neat. And I, I was one not that long ago was about six, 700 people. And just as a, as a routine question, I said, by the way, by show of hands, how many people here have written a book? And I think it was one or two hands went up of all those people. And then I, I use a lot of my stories. I involved being a pilot because I've been a long time pilot. And I said, and then something else came up and I tell a story about getting in trouble and how gratitude saved me and so forth. But I say, by the way, so show of hands again, how many people have been a pilot? One, maybe two hands. So when you talk about that book coming on that porch, I totally get that because it's just so you're around it all the time, but against the general populace, it's a one tenth of one half of one percent, or it's something that's really small. The people that everybody talks about, I'm going to write a book, but how many people do it? Well, it's totally a game changer because I, as soon as I got published, I started mailing my books away to meeting planners. And to my surprise, they started booking me at five, 10, 15, 20 grand. I was shocked. I couldn't mm -hmm. believe it. And I kept saying, why did you book me? There had to have been others. And every single time they'd say, oh yeah, Patrick, we had 15 or 18 or 47 people that emailed us and they all had their highlight video link on their 
on their email, but you, Mr. Snow, you were the only one that mailed an actual signed copy of the book. Mm -hmm. They said, well, great. What do you think of the book? And they said, oh, well, I'm sorry, but we have seven of us on the speaker selection committee and not a single one of us actually had time to read your book, but right. we loved the way that it looked. And that's why we booked you. Yeah. And in that moment, I realized it wasn't so much about the actual content of the book. It was about having a 250 to 300 page hardcover book that you could plunk down on a meeting planner's desk. And when they're looking at 10 or 12 speakers, they always select more times than not. They're going to pick the most credentialed one. And when you have the word author next to your name on your business card, then you're viewed as the authority in your subject matter. Mm -hmm. So then it just comes down to, are you a jerk? Are you nice? Are you easy to work with? Are you aloof? Will you show up early? Will you stay late? And I can't tell you how many bookings I've gotten because you know, a lot of speakers show up 10 minutes before their speech. And as soon as it's over, they're, they're out the door before the, you know, the clapping stops. Mm -hmm. My mentor taught me, you show up the first one in the morning and you stay until the very last person has left. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, I've booked hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue, one hour, two hours, three hours after I've gotten off stage, because I've stuck around to develop that relationship with those people. Yeah. And then they realize, oh, wow, that Patrick's not like the other speaker that we had. He's actually a good guy. He's a nice guy. We like him. He's easy to work with. You know what? Let's book him for this or book him for that. So it's a lot more than just the stage time. It's the, it's the relationships. And it's like anything yeah. else. It's the no like, and trust principle, right? If they know you like you and trust you, then they're going to book you. Well, and I also think it's just a good philosophy just in general, like the old, I'm always been a proponent, although I ended up running a few minutes late today, but you're 50 minutes early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're 50 minutes late, forget about it. You know, yeah. and it's just, it's interesting that you mentioned that first to show up last, just in general. And it kind of brings me back to the whole personal growth and development and self-help industry. I'm thinking, I'm sure it happened to you because you and I have that in common very early on. I remember when it was Tony Robbins, but before that it was Zig Ziglar and just a lot of different people, the Jack Canfields and, and Mark Victor Hansen, just various people that I'd listen to tapes and so forth. But I'm, may, I'm amazed how many people, if you're and tell me if this has happened to you where you're talking to people in general, but they kind of poo poo it like it's, oh, that's that woo woo stuff. And I always think, well, tell me what is working for you in your life. If it's not personal development, how don't you want to get better as a person? Have you found that much along the way for you and then people that kind of occasionally sort of, like I say, poo poo it? Well, I think what I found is people don't like the word motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. And so I try to, maybe it's the Matt Farley. My name is Matt Farley <laughs> and I'm a motivational speaker. You know, the whole Saturday Night Live stick. Right. So I've tried to use the word inspirational speaker. Mm -hmm. And by using inspirational and professional speaker, I think it's opened more doors. But mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Um, and what I've learned over the years is that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are the 90% of people who have given up on their dreams, their goals, and their vision, visions, and they've accepted a life of mediocrity. And they don't think that they have any ability to have any influence on their present life or their future life. So they're just kind of, you know, riding out the clock, you know, punching the time clock of life, not taking that, you know, directorship role in their life's movie. They just are going wherever the leaves blow them to. So what I found about 10% of us are people like you and I that are constantly investing in ourselves. that we understand that a, a completed education can take a hundred years or more, right. understands that you need to invest in yourself and in your business and your time, and that we're continuously learning. And those 10% of the people, those are the ones that are ultimately uh, living the life of their dreams and creating their own destiny. And so I kind of mentally sort people into those two categories when I, you know, meet them. And part of it is, it's like, well, you know what, if, if you don't believe that you want anything more out of life, no matter what I say in stage, I'm not going to be able to help you. Mm -hmm. But if you have an open mind and you're willing to take action and, and to dream and plan and execute, then, then you can soar in life. And so there's nothing wrong. Everybody else is on their own journey and their journey is a wonderful journey, but it might not be my journey or your journey. We might want more. And when I've learned that, I've just kind of removed all expectations from other people and just focused on my own, you know, career path and my own growth. Interesting. Did you notice, I like that 90% too, giving up on their dreams. When you have people at the book table afterwards, it's always very rewarding to me that they make nice comments about the talk and they want to buy the books. I want to get a couple for my kids and, and things like that. But did you notice the sort of same 90%, 10% ratio with the people that are at your, uh, at your book table that are talking to you afterwards, where for how many people there could you tell? 
it's the the people that come to the table and the people that buy the books they're the ones that are still in that learning phase still right. in that growing phase still in that networking phase and the other 90 percent of the audience are like this like <laughs> yeah. who's that you know 40 year old 50 year old gonna teach me i'm, I'm 10 years to his senior what's he gonna teach me exactly. so i would tell you one of the lines that i've used from day one is i try to disarm my audiences and the way that I disarm my audience is right now I'm 52 years old. So I would get on stage and I'd say, you know what, before we begin, I just want you guys to know that I'm not going to teach you guys a darn thing today. Is that fair enough? There's going to be no teaching going on. My role today is to humor you. So please laugh at my jokes. My role today is to inspire you. My role today, most importantly, is to remind you of all those things that you've already learned. And then I'm going to challenge you to take action on that knowledge that you have. Because I can learn more from those people in the audience than you can learn from me. And as soon as I do that, I see this in the audience. I, I see they go from, oh, <laughs> okay, I like this guy. He's not all ego. He's not a narcissist, you know? And uh, yeah, but you're right. 90% of the audience are too busy and they just leave, go to the next thing. And the other 10% come to the back of the room or, or maybe it's 20 or 30%. And, and the point of it is, it's different with, depends on what, you know, if you're with a bunch of government workers, oftentimes it could be 99, 1%. Yeah. If you're with a bunch of, you know, direct sales, you know, network marketing, it could be, you know, 30% have given up and 70% believe in their dreams. So yeah. the percentages are always different based on the industries, but you're right. It is that not everybody's growing and that's okay. Everybody's on their different soul level journey. And we got to honor that. Yeah, honored. That's exactly right. You know, I was thinking I do an exercise called an association evaluator, and it asks the people, this is sometimes in keynotes, but it's more in workshops where I ask them to think about one or two people they may want to disassociate from that just aren't healthy for them. Then one or two people you want to just limit, perhaps in your life that just, you know, again, they're maybe your, your brother, or your somebody you're closer to, but you just don't want to spend as much time with them. one or two people you want to expand your association. But then the fourth one is one I really like is one or two people that have mentored your, you or one or two people that you can mentor. So you mentioned mentor, you don't have to say by name, but talk about your mentor and what he or she meant to you and what was maybe some of the biggest things that they really were able to help you with. Well, I will tell you what, in my early years, I didn't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to invest in coaching or training or whatever. And so I would just go to every speech that I could. I would just read, I think I read 2000 books on personal growth and development, you know, between 21 and 25 years old. And so a lot of these people became my virtual mentors. And so some of those people I've met, some of them I haven't. And mm -hmm. so Zig Ziglar is a, a, an amazing mentor that I've met once. And he gave me some great advice. Um, you know, Ogmandino, I've never met, but he's been a huge impact on my life. Tony Robbins, I've met. Um, Zig, uh, no, Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen, I met both of those. Brian Tracy, I met him. He's been a great mentor. He gave me some fantastic advice once when we shared the stage, to, uh, actually twice when we shared the stage together. Les Brown, you know, live your dreams. It's not over until you win. Never let someone else's opinion of you determine your reality. You know, that mantra that he's had has been my entire focus or belief my entire life. Because every time we speak, you know how it is. One or two people will come out of the audience and try to poo-poo on you. One or two will say, you know what? They'll give you a bad evaluation. It has nothing to do with you or your performance. It has everything to do with, you know, they have the degree in journalism. They want to be the author. They studied public speaking in school and they wanted to be a professional speaker, but because they never did that, they're upset that you achieved their dreams. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to come after you and try to tell you to stop and to retire. And so that's one of the things Les Brown taught me is, look, it's none of my opinion about them and their attitude. Whatever their opinion is about me, it doesn't matter. I'm here for those people that want to learn and grow. So there have been uh, probably a dozen or two dozen spectacular mentors in my life. And those are just some of them. My father is a mentor. I used to watch him in church every Sunday as a kid. And I thought, you know what? One day, maybe one day I could get up on stage and speak like him. Um, you know, so on and on, I could go on for hours talking about these people. My high school football coach is my high school basketball coach. Um, my high school football coach taught me, he said, Patrick, you need to play when you're hurt. Because sooner or later in life, you're going to learn that anybody and everybody who's achieved anything of significance, they've always had to play when they've been hurt. And I remember once in Miami, Florida, I had 105 degree temperature and they had already paid me 10 grand to speak. And I was sick as a dog and I had just landed 
uh, at the airport and I barely got to my hotel and I need to be on stage at eight in the morning. And my temperature was out of control. I was burning up and I lost my voice. And I'm like, I don't want to give these people back $10,000. I got to, you know, buck up and get on stage the next morning. And somehow thankful God gave me the energy to get through that speech. And after the speech, I went back to my hotel room and I slept for like a day. And so that's plain hurt. And I learned that from a high school football coach, not from anybody in the business world. So too many mentors to, not to mention. That's good, though. It's, it's such an important point, though, I think, too. And if you look at your clients, you're really mentoring them, of course. And when you go back to speaking, publishing, uh, books, all that, do you have kind of a favorite type of client that you like to coach the most when it comes to coaching coaches you mentioned as well? Is there one that's your favorite? Uh, the favorite type of clients that I love are those that are still learning, that are coachable, that they're not know-it-alls, that they don't have all the answers. Like there's three award-winning title formulas that most people have no idea about. There's formulas for your table of contents. There's formulas for a title, subtitle, tagline. There's a formula for the inside flap copy with a headline and 250 words. There's a hundred decisions that you got to make in the process of writing and publishing a book, a hundred. Most people make 20 to 30 of them correctly and they fail on 70 to 80 decisions. And that's why their book is lousy and it never sells. And so I used to get frustrated because I would encourage them, here are the reality, 25 years of doing this industry, doing speaking, doing coaching professionally, publishing 1,300 books. You know, I've learned what a book, good book cover looks like. I've learned what a compelling hook of a title is. I've learned how you write an eight to nine paragraph introduction that's about you and your, you and your, you and your, about the reader not about me and my, or I'm a victim, read my book because this happened to me and that happened to me and I'm a poor old victim. And yet everybody wants to do that in their book. And so somebody, one of my own clients, I was frustrated and I was echoing my frustrations to another client. And he said, Patrick, you know what, as a coach, you know what I learned a long time ago? That your job as a coach is simply to tell your clients that the stove is hot. That's your role. And then it's up to them. They can either choose to touch the stove and burn their hand and do it the wrong way, or they can take your advice and feel and smell and experience the heat without touching it and then do it your way. And in that moment, it was such a freeing thought to realize, you know what? He's right. My goal is to tell him the stove is hot. It's up to them. They can choose to touch it or not. So my favorite kind of clients are those that are still learning and those that are coachable. Can you tell there's so much now about vetting and, of course, the whole HR space is so different now from when I was growing up. I think it was called personnel back then. Do you find that you can tell, just like when you meet somebody, Patrick, David, David, Patrick, and in that first 30 or 60 seconds, when it's a coaching client, can you kind of tell pretty early on if this is somebody who's going to be successful in the coaching? Uh, do you mean as a client? As an yes, author? as a client, as a client. Yeah. And the answer is, is, you know, do they have all the answers? Are they a know-it-all? Mm -hmm. And a lot of, and I'm like, well, how many books have you published? Well, this is my first book. How long have you been speaking? Well, I've never been paid to speak. Well, how many coaching clients do you have? Well, no, I just took this weekend coaching certification. I haven't done that yet. So then I'm able to ascertain right away that they have no credentials to do the speaking, the coaching, the consulting, the books or whatever else. And that's really what I'm trying to do is help people leverage a book. A book is a platform from which they stand on use that as the world's greatest marketing secret to attract more speaking, coaching, consulting revenue, or whatever the product or service that you're selling is, you use that book as a hook to attract more business. And it's pretty clear right out of the get-go within the first 10 minutes, they tell me right out of the gate, um, either they have all the answers and I say, look, you don't need me. You don't need to hire me. You've got all the answers already. Or other people say, you know what, Patrick, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, I don't want to spend, you know, five years doing this. I don't want to lose a hundred thousand dollars. Like some of these nightmares you hear on the internet. I don't want to make the wrong choice and go with one of these internet publishers that scam me out of my, you know, mortgage payments. Right. Um, I don't want to have to take a second mortgage to do a book. So I, I want to use your proven system. So let, let's lock arms together. So it's pretty quick that you can find that out. And yeah. you know what? It's like that in life, whatever people believe. And I certainly don't want to talk politics on this, but whatever people believe in politics, they're right because they've trained their mind to believe them to be right. Mm -hmm. Whatever people believe about religion, they're right because they've trained their mind to believe that. Yeah. And so there's nothing that we can do except, you know, be the change we wish to see. 
but whatever we say out of our mouth can't change anything. Exactly. So if there's somebody out there in the listening audience that is thinking, gosh, this might be something I want to do, whether it's the coaching or whether it's the publishing of a book, what would be the one or two or three things you would tell them to come to you kind of be prepared to have X, Y, Z in your mind or on paper or in a list, or what would be a couple of things you'd tell them to be ready to talk about once they got together with you to think about maybe coaching? Well, the first thing I tell them that your book is your speech, your speech is your book. They're one and the same. Mm-hmm. Your book is your coaching practice. Your coaching practice is your book. It's one and the same. Your consultancy is your book and your book is your consultancy. So whatever you're doing already, it is your book. So my first homework assignments I give to people, whether they're a client or not, and I'll give this to anybody listening on this podcast is number one, jot down 20 lessons you want your readers to learn as a result of reading your book. Number two, understand that every lesson becomes a chapter in the book. Number three, sequentially put these 20 chapters in the right order, A to Z as they would make sense chronologically. Number three, there's four, there's three award-winning title formulas. The number one award-winning title formula is the ING rule, which says you take a verb, add an ING action verb to it to make it a gerund, and then have all your chapters do that to make the entire book an action book. And then I tell them that, look, you need to write about the most booked speaking topics. And Mm. the number one most booked speaking topic on planet Earth is leadership and self-leadership. And then if you want to do coaching, you need to write about the most booked coaching topics, which are change, empowerment, and transformation. So right out of the gate, I have all of my clients have these five chapters in the book. Self-leadership, leadership, change, transformation, and empowerment. And you have that as the platform of your book. You can't go wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, I think is we'll be wrapping up in a couple of minutes. And I was thinking, I kind of always like to get to the takeaways. And I think I'm just making note of some of the things. And I don't know if I'd put them in any particular order, but actually before I go to the takeaways, what, because it's my favorite word, grateful. It is that gratitude guys podcast. What were you most grateful for, for your father? Um. There's a quote that I saw on the internet, uh, a Facebook meme, and I think it said, I'm so grateful for my dad because he lived his life and he allowed me to observe it. Mm. And you know, what that means is so many fathers, maybe they're struggling themselves with drugs or alcohol, or maybe they've been unfaithful to their, the mother of you know, that child. And yet they sit there and they tell the kid, do this, do that, do this, do that. But then they themselves go out and they are not all there together. I think what I've been so blessed about my father is my father was a strong man of faith, a strong man of principles, morals, ethics, of character. Um, You know, he was a school teacher and a coach. That's how he earned his living. And he wasn't very wealthy in terms of dollars and money and and net worth. But when I pat, when he passed, I got his Detroit Tigers baseball cap and his Michigan State Spartans baseball cap and then his hunting compass. And that's what I got. And I can't even tell you how many clients I have and friends that I know. Oh, I can't wait when my parents die. I've got $2 million coming or I got $100,000 coming or you know what? My will and trust and this and that. And I'm like, you know what? I wouldn't trade any of it. What I got from my father was love. Mm -hmm. self-confidence, self-esteem, self-belief, the ability to go after anything in the world that I want. So Jack Snow was the rock of the foundation that set me free to be who I am today. And I would like to think that I'm a living extension of who he was. And when I look at my hands now at 52, I see my father's hands. And I don't look the same at 52 that I looked when I'm 18 and never thought that I looked like him. But every now and then I look in the mirror and I'm like, wow, at 52, I kind of look like him. And so it's not about money. It's about values, principles, morals, ethics, beliefs, behavior, and getting the opportunity to watch my father grow up. That to me is irreplaceable. And I think that's what we don't understand that when our parents give birth to us, they're a young kid in their twenties. Exactly. And then we have the great gift that we get to watch our parents grow up and grow old. What a gift. And if they have morals, values, and ethics, we get to learn based on their behaviors. And for me, that was, that was him. That was Jack Snow. 
Well, and it's interesting too. I think once I had children too, I really came to understand what it's like to be a parent and it made me appreciate the role of my parents more. And I, I've often said, I've been fortunate to manage a lot of people in these big stores like Nordstrom and Lowe's and things like that. And managing people and raising children, in my estimation, require the same basic skill at number one, and that is you have to set a great example. And it sounds like Jack Snow set a great example, whether it's faith or work ethic or belief or all those things that he passed on to you. And 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 I, I use the word grateful many, many times, but I can just imagine if you look back to some of those friends that were too busy worrying what kind of trust fund they're going to get or the money when the parents passed, how fortunate you were to have that kind of relationship with your dad. And it's and a lot of people don't. And so again, something to be really grateful for. So that's, that's really cool. He said one time to me about 10 years uh, into uh, the marriage to the boy's mother, about 10 years in, we were having some challenges and he pulled me aside and uh, we were driving actually to, we were at a family reunion and we were driving to go get like 40 pizzas for all the aunts and uncles and cousins. And he said something to me and I'll never forget. He said, Patrick, what you need to understand is that family is the most important thing in the world. And you need to fight like hell always and forever to honor and cherish your family. And I did just that. And I fought emotionally for another 10 years. And, and then after 20 years, you know, I learned that she fell in love with her coworker. So I blessed her, forgave her and sent her on her way. And to this day, she and I are great friends and I'm super happy for her and her new her new marriage and whatever else. But to me, it was, you know, family is the most important thing. Fight like hell forever and for always to cherish it. And I've tried to pass that value down to my, down to my kids. Yeah, that's a good value. Well, I think some of the key takeaways and we'll wrap up. I made a note here to play when you're, when you were hurt. I really like that one too, because somebody might argue, oh, wait a sec, you don't want to make your energy, but it's the concept that there's going to be times that things aren't going to always line up for you. Invest in yourself, the time and money, very, very important. Don't be a know-it-all. I've always said there's two types of people in the world, the lifelong learners and the know-it-alls. Please don't be a know-it-all. Uh, tell them the stove is hot. I like that too. Uh, write about the hot topics. That was good. And then lastly, family is the most important thing in the world. I completely agree. So let me wrap up, Patrick, with my final question that I always close my podcast with. What does, now that I know you're 52, I had a feeling you're in the late 40s, early 50s. What do you know at 52 and you get to pick one thing that you would have liked to have known when you were 18 that would have helped you? You know that... Uh... You don't need to know the how. You mm. just need to taste the vision, touch the vision, smell the vision, emotionalize the vision. And once you learn to own your visions, the how slowly prevents itself uh, over time. And then taking that step on, what I've learned in my later years, the more gratitude that I've had for life and thanking God daily for all the blessings that I have in my life, the universe, source, spirit, God, whatever you want to call it, continues to give me more of that which I'm most grateful for. And so I loved your quote. I wrote this down. Gratitude turns what you have into enough. And so I, I sit on my back patio every night looking into the stars right before I go to bed, do a little meditation. And I thank God every day for all the blessings that I have. And then what mysteriously and magically happens, everything that I've been thanking God for for these last five or 10 years more of that keeps showing up in my life. Absolutely. And I suspect that's something that you teach as well. And it's so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, well said. Well, excellent. I've certainly enjoyed this. So uh, that is it for this episode. And just a couple of reminders. I gave you the takeaways from Patrick, which were fantastic. Uh, but just as a reminder, the podcast is available every Tuesday morning at 5 a.m. on the Transformation Talk Radio Network and is available on Apple, Spotify, Google, and other pod work, podcast locations. Please subscribe and give me a five-star rating if you like what you hear. Thank you. To purchase a gratitude journal and find out about gratitude coaching and one-on-one -on -one and group coaching, you can reach me at thatgratitudeguy.com. And then one thing that people ask me a lot about, I send out a Monday morning minute. It's a 60-second video every Monday morning. If you're interested in getting that, it kind of starts your week off on a positive note. You can get to the Monday morning minute by texting at 22828. That's You text in the number box, 22828. And in the message box, you type in gratitude guy and it'll send you a link and you can sign up and then you'll get the Monday morning minute. And then also as an exclusive to my podcast listeners, I often my six month 
offer that is my six month proprietary coaching program to transform your life for the three month price. And you can just email me at david at thatgratitudediet.com. So once again, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate the support. And until next time, I am David George Brook, That Gratitude Guy. Remember, be grateful and never quit. Take care. Thank you for listening to That Gratitude Guy podcast with David George Brook, where living with gratitude turns what you have into enough. Transformation starts now and you have everything you need to achieve great things. In a world that is constantly changing, there is motivation and inspiration right in front of us. And you can find yours right now. Don't wait. Visit thatgratitudeguy.com to get started living with gratitude today.